with your high school girlfriend after all these years, and it really was just as nice, and then somebody comes along and says, okay, that's it, time's up. Uh, you have to divide it again. And I use the romantic um, metaphor deliberately because romantic nationalism often has those kind of overtones. Um, so there were many discussions and no decisions. In fact, when Eshkol came to the United States at the beginning of 1968 to meet with Lyndon Johnson at the Johnson Ranch in Texas, he was asked several times by Johnson and his staff, what kind of Israel do you want, which was really a question about the future of the territories. Uh, a reliable source says that Eshkol's answer was, my government has decided not to decide. Um, I don't think that that's the only time that governments have decided that. Um, but it's a particularly striking example because in many ways that decision not to decide has, has defined Israeli politics and perhaps regional politics ever since. Um, I'm not, I, I want to stress, I don't think that that's the only factor. Um, I'm, I'm telling the story from within Israeli sources. The inevitable danger of doing so is that it leaves in the background uh, the unlit sides of the stage, the very, very important factors of what was going on in Arab politics at the time. But I've been given a half an hour to speak, and that's too little time even for the Israeli side. So um, I want to stress that in doing that, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm desperately trying to avoid the mistake of acting like the whole story is on one side of, of the political thing for good or for bad. There's just so much I can talk about at once. Um, if I could do both at the same time, like simultaneously, I would do that, but that's really difficult. I haven't learned how to do that. Um, a, so in the absence of a decision, um, well, very often when no decision is made, what happens is certain political cultural factors come out. It is possible to have policy without a decision. That, I think, is the most important point to make here. In the secret National Security Council history of the 1967 crisis, written at the end of 1968, just as the American administrations were about to change, uh, the person who wrote the history, Harold Saunders, who was then the head of the uh, Mideast desk in, at the um, Security Council, National Security Council, refers to two decisions that were made by the Security Council when the crisis began in May of 1967, and he puts the word decision in quotes, and he explains that there was never actually any discussion of those decisions. They were just assumed as policy. And so he says, these are very important decisions, but you won't find any record of those decisions in the record. Um, I think that this happens very often. When things aren't decided, other factors come in, and assumptions, uh, uh, and particularly cultural assumptions, historical political assumptions, drive uh, what becomes policy. Um, and in this particular case, one of the policies that developed was the policy of settling in the territory. So you have two things which I think you have to keep in mind at the same time. There was no strategic decision taken. There was a specific decision not to take a strategic decision on the future of the West Bank following the 1967 war. And a policy was pursued which led to deeper and deeper Israeli entanglement and making it more and more difficult to pull out, which was the settlement policy. This was based on the fact that um, in pre-independence time, settlement served a variety of functions in uh, Zionist uh, politics and development. It had become a value in of itself to settle the land. Uh, it, it had to do not only with expanding the territory under Jewish control, but with a whole conception of returning to the soil. Again, in romantic nationalist movements, um, the idea of the peasantry returning to the soil is very strong. Um, it's very interesting, actually, there's a history of Palestinian uh, national development by Yazid Saeed, which talks about the fact that after 1967, as the Palestinian organizations grew, there was a romanticization of the farmer of the peasant. Well, in early uh, Zionist history, the exact same thing was going on. The, the Jew working the land was the ideal. Um, sort of a ma imagine Mao sending the intellectuals to the countryside, but without uh, doing it by force as a voluntary thing. So settling the land was something very important. Uh, it was also seen as a way of establishing um, what the future borders would be. And very soon after the, the war, a process of settlement began. In fact, in June, sorry, July of 1967, five weeks after the end of the war, a young left-wing secular kibbutznik jumped out of a jeep at the abandoned Syrian army base of Aleka in the Golan Heights and became the first Israeli settler in occupied territory. He was joined in the weeks after that by other young kibbutzniks. Um, they wanted to ensure that the Golan would stay in Israeli hands. They also wanted to relive the past that they'd missed, the pre-state uh, glory days of, of, of establishing kibbutzim on new land. Yeah, it was as if it was, a, it was, they were going back to Woodstock, as it were, in, in Israeli terms. They could do what their parents had done, and that they'd always been told what the great people do, and that they had missed. There's 
um, there's an interesting description in uh, Paul Berman's book, I think it's called um, Four Utopias, of how much 19, the, the student demonstrations of 1968 were driven by people whose parents had been um, communist and particularly resistance fighters during World War II and wanted to relive their parents' heroism. And um, in the Israeli context, many of the people who were involved in this first settlement activity in the Golan were doing exactly that. They were, they were trying to do it the way it had been done before. In September of 1967, uh, the leaders of eight Arab states met in Khartoum in order to discuss their political response to the 67 war. Um, um, again, by the way, this, there's another nomenclature problem. In Israeli Chronicles, this is the Six-Day War. In Arab Chronicles, this is the June 1967 War. I almost feel like I have to keep switching back and forth because the moment you use one term or the other, you have um, established a position, and I am trying to remain ambiguous and ambivalent and fool you all. Um, uh, so at the Khartoum conference, the Arab leaders, uh, 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 not fool you all, keep you guessing. Okay. Um, that's more fair. Uh, the Arab leaders passed a resolution, the Khartoum resolution. One line of it, the, the operative line said, the Arab heads of states have agreed to unite their political efforts at the international and diplomatic level in order to wreak withdrawal of the aggressive Israeli forces from the Arab lands, meaning the Arab lands occupied since June 5th. On the Arab side, the Khartoum resolutions were seen as a victory of the moderates. Political and diplomatic means would be used rather than military means. The aim was to return the land occupied in June of 67 and not to try to take all of Israel. In fact, in American diplomatic correspondence from Arab capitals from September and October of 1967, there's references to Arab leaders talking of the moderate spirit of Khartoum. However, the same resolution also stated that there would be no negotiation with Israel, no recognition of Israel, and no formal peace with Israel. Within Israel, that's the part of the resolution that echoed most strongly, and it was seen as a complete rejection of, of peace efforts. Um, at that point, Levi Eshkol, the Prime Minister, decided to approve the first settlement in uh, the West Bank at Kfar Etzion. Before doing so, he consulted with the legal counsel of the Foreign Ministry, whose name was Theodore Meron. This is a name worth remembering. If you haven't heard it before, I'll explain in a moment. Meron wrote back a memo, which I found in Eshkol's office files. It had been classified until very recently. And he wrote, my conclusion is that civilian settlement in the administered territories contravenes the explicit provisions of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Again, that was an internal Israeli memo. Just to explain the background, Miron was 37 years old at the time. He was a Holocaust survivor. He had come to Palestine, mandatory Palestine, in 1947. By 10 years after that, he completed his degree in international law at Harvard and his uh, postdoc at Cambridge. Rather amazing considering the fact that he never went to school during the years of the war because he was in a Nazi labor camp. Um, in 1977, he left the Israeli Foreign Service to return to academia at New York University. Uh, where he laid the theoretical groundwork for what became the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which he eventually became the president of and now serves on the appeals court of. So you have somebody who at least later on became an internationally recognized figure in the field of international humanitarian law. That was his memo. There was one loophole in the, uh, uh, intended or not, in the Meron memo. It pointed out correctly in terms of the Geneva Convention that it is permissible for the occupying power to establish temporary military bases in occupied territory. Uh, Eshkol announced that Kfar Etzion would be established as a Nahal outpost. Nahal was a, uh, remains a branch of the Israeli army in which the soldiers alternate between direct military duties and maintaining paramilitary agricultural outposts. So officially, according to the announcement, Kfar Etzion was a temporary military base. Um, it was a recognition and, a, and an effort to get around Meron's ruling, you had a situation where the, the uh, prime minister himself was now acting like one of those young pre-state activists. I will stress here, one of the most difficult things for a successful political revolution, and uh, I think that the establishment of the state in, in terms of Israeli history was a successful political revolution, is it requires the leaders to move from being revolutionaries to being bureaucrats. Um, and this is um, disappointing. Uh, you've worked all your life to get someplace, and now you have to follow rules, you have to go to meetings, you have to wear a suit. Well, they didn't wear suits in Israel, but okay, you have to wear a white shirt. Um, it, and the romantic days of your youth are appealing to you. Post-1967, there was a feeling which swept through large parts of the bureaucracy that the glory days are back. Ironically, 
the result of this was, in fact, in some ways, returning the pre-48 situation of a conflict between two ethnic communities in a single, under the rule of a single 